This is Jeffrey Tucker. It's my pleasure to be here with Frank Karsten, uh, who is in Amsterdam. He's the author of the ebook of the week, uh, Beyond Democracy. Welcome, Frank. Well, uh, thanks for having me, uh, Jeffrey. Nice to be with you. We um, are about to go into an election. Are you following the American election at all? Not really, no. No, I don't follow the Dutch elections either, actually. <laughs> I mean, I think it's important for libertarians not to take uh, politics too serious. I see, yeah. Um, and this is one of the reasons you wrote your book, right? Well, yes, I think uh, libertarians still, many libertarians still think that the, the way to more... Uh, more freedom is through the democratic process, and uh, we, we we refute that uh, notion in the book in a way that actually democracy is a collectivist idea, and well, in general, it leads to more collectivism, higher taxes, more regulation, bigger government, and that secession is a better, far better idea to uh, gain more freedom. You know, it's interesting because. The old classical liberals liked democracy because they thought that it, uh, it brought a certain freedom to the choice of the kind of government uh, that the people have. Yes, uh, well, they were mistaken. In, in a way, they were right, of course. Uh, but if you look at uh, how democracy works, it, it is uh, almost even the freedom-loving people, uh, they tend to choose a big government. For uh, you can compare democracy with the tragedy of the commons. You you have dinner with hundred people, and everyone has a very strong incentive, even whether they're frugal, uh, to order that extra uh, expensive dessert for say ten dollars, and you would only have to pay ten cents for that. So uh, it is a system that um, makes uh, collectivist of the most people, and uh, it is a collectivist idea, like I said. It uh, progresses towards more collectivism. So, uh, yeah, well, the results are in after a, after a century of democracy now. Uh, they're not good. Yes, and I think that the results might have surprised somebody like, um, maybe like Thomas Jefferson uh, or uh, the other, others of that 18th century generation. Don't you think that so many people were optimistic that if we can get rid of the king, get rid of yes. the the aristocratic privileges, then we will have freedom. Yes, that's, uh, I, I can understand that. I mean, um, you have the, the rulers, but you have little power yourself. And you think, well, uh, we are against the rulers then. We, we as a people decide. But of course, the people, there, are, there is no such thing as the people, actually, because they all have different ideas. And in a democracy, they fight each other and the governments. But, uh, um, but they fight each other more than the government. They, they take away each other's freedoms and money and, and through the democratic process. So it's not, you, people think as democracy as a system uh, through which you control the government. And in, in a certain aspect, that is true. But in another aspect, aspect it's also true that uh, people are fighting each other. And that's, that's very, uh, it's very bad for the society as a whole. So that's very interesting because the one remaining defense of democracy that I, that I, at least for me, seems, when I read it, it sounds a little bit uh, true, is that at least with democracy, we avoid uh, the violence, uh, like aggressive, change of government, yes. yeah, bl like blood, bloodshed, right, with, yes. a, with a change of government. Like in the Roman times, for instance, when, when many emperors were uh, killed, uh, and uh, this, this is, of course, true, but the problem is that uh, the rulers are generally also in a democratic system, uh, well, you can consider them as uh, human farmers. And uh, for the, the livestock, it doesn't really matter who is farming the livestock. Uh, uh, as you can see, the, the Obama and the Romneys, they are, uh, they consider themselves very different, but in a way, they're, they're very similar in what they do. So it doesn't really matter uh, what government you get. In, in the Netherlands, it's pretty much the same. I mean, the, the free market liberals, uh, uh, 
they, they, they say, well, we're going to lessen taxes or whatever and have more freedom. But in reality, little comes of it and they increase taxes too, like in, in many European countries nowadays with, uh, because of the so-called austerity measures. You know, it's very common for people to believe that they've been betrayed by, uh, by the leaders who, once elected, do things that are different from what they say. Uh, and this is almost universal. It's, it's actually a little bit silly. Uh, I mean, at what point are we going to recognize that there doesn't seem to be any necessary relationship between what people say and what they what they do in the political marketplace. Am I right about that? I think so. Yes, uh, but but the problem is people still uh, believe in democracy. They think, well, we we do have the wrong leaders, coincidentally, and we should just vote for the right leaders, and then then things will uh, you know improve. But of course, if you're politician, even if you have good intentions, it's very difficult uh, in a democracy when you come to power to change things. Uh, we, we talked about earlier about Ron Paul and you thought, well, uh, when Ron, Ron Paul will uh, win the presidential elections, probably government will, will increase, because not so much because of Ron Paul, but the, the, the power, uh, people in power, like at the departments of the defense, and then they, they, they pull the strings and they want to they wanna tell him who's in charge. Yeah. And uh, they will show uh, how, how that's done. So yeah. I think it's very powerful, uh, very difficult to change in a way. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's true even in, um, in your own life or even in a business environment. Uh, for one person to change much of anything that involves a group effort, right? Uh, even in the private sector, it's very difficult. Uh, yes. So why do we imagine that we can just elect somebody who can w walk into something like as gigantic and old and established as government and really make a difference? It's a little bit... Funny, it's don't you think that people kind of sort of suspend plausibility on uh, when it comes to democracy? It's like we want to believe things that can't possibly be true. Yes, I think we suffer from the Stockholm syndrome in a way. Uh, we have democracy, we have to say, and every individual knows that they can't get rid of them, and so they say, All right, well. Uh, Let's let's think it is okay then, and, and, and uh, you know make up the idea that we have a way out. Yeah. But of course, there is not, not through democracy. I think, and um, well, of course, uh, our book tries to help in in that regard in, in smashing people's idea on, on politicians and the state and uh, democracy. No. And if, well, there have been some cases, or ha have there not? some cases of reform towards freedom. Yes. Well, in the Netherlands, there is, there, uh, well, the country I know best, of course, uh, we had uh, legalization of drugs, uh, we had euthanasia, uh, uh, prostitution was legalized, and tax, of course. Um, what else do we have? Abortion. Uh, um, these freedoms are rather unique in, in, in the world. Uh, they're not as far as would like them to see, but uh, they have changed. And also, of course, uh, in the in the eighties, in my in our book, we we say that uh, well, taxes have risen in all democratic countries from ten percent hundred years ago to, to about fifty. Uh, but in the eighties, they were actually a bit higher. And uh, of course, if you if you if you tax people too much, then you you get less uh, income. So there is a small incentive. For, uh, for politicians to to be uh, easy going on that, but uh, yeah, some, sometimes you see uh, improvements. But in general, if you look at the long term, I see I see uh, more regulation, higher taxes, and more governments, and uh, uh, that's a bad that thing. So in the end, yes, it's a, it's a negative development. Well, uh, what do you think? So this is the interesting question. When you see a tendency towards more freedom in a society, in a democratic society, what is, what is driving that? Is it, is it the democratic process or is it something like public opinion, maybe? 
Um, I think it is technology. Because now I wouldn't be a libertarian and we wouldn't be having this interview without the internet. And I think technology is a liberating, uh, liberating thing uh, in many cases. It, it's, it empowers the individual. Uh, as soon as that is possible, then, uh, well, people tend to have uh, freer ideas of things. As soon as something becomes technologically possible, then, then they think differently on it. So uh, that is uh, a big uh, drive towards more freedom, I hope. And, uh, well, the internet is our big ally. But yes. public opinion, I think uh, most people do not um, change their ideas based on logic or facts. They base their, change their ideas on, on based on uh, um, experience. And when the, the, the democracy hits the wall of reality, then people will start thinking in different directions. In your book, do you, uh, do you address this question of war? There's a belief that democracies tend to be more peaceful with their neighbors. Well, if you look at the United States, um, well, they're not quite peaceful. They have uh, military bases in about 150 countries or something, and they spend more on, well, they call it defense, uh, than the rest of the world, uh, almost 50%. And uh, I don't know, uh, Romney and is happy to attack Iran, I think. And uh, so um, I, I'm, not, I'm not a specialist on this issue. Uh, my, my co-author, Carl, uh, that I wrote the book with, uh, he wrote the myth on democratic peace. But uh, I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. And even if it were, then um, you could still say that democracy is actually a very violent uh, philosophy or, or a violent system because the minority can't escape. Uh, and, but you don't, you don't see the violence because the, the minority just, you know, they don't fight back. Uh, but, um, well, I think in general, they might be more peaceful towards each other. But if you look at the United States, it's, it's, it's not such a peaceful country. Yeah, yeah. And it's the most powerful democracy in the world. Well, it, it's, it's interesting that this presumption exists that... Um, the majority should should rule, but uh, what do you make of the the observation of the, the public choicers that it, that it, a public choice school that it's really the well organized minorities that are actually ruling the society under democracy? I think that is correct. Yeah. If you if you uh, for instance uh, Greens, they, they tend to uh, have a lot of demonstrations and protests, and they yell very loudly. And that helps in a democracy. And while there's, for instance, uh, many uh, small uh, entrepreneurs, uh, business owners, they don't have the time to uh, go to Washington or any other city to demonstrate. Mm -hmm. uh, but also you see, of course, the, the lobby groups that are uh, very influential and mostly, uh, you know, outside of you, outside of you of, of, the, of the average person. So I think that is correct. Uh, I think actually they say um, democracy is the um, the tyranny of the majority and uh, I think that is too too, too flattery I mean it's not the majority it's it's, uh, it, it's some minorities and you never show what it is but you have big in, in the United States you have of course big agra big oil uh, big medicine uh, and they, they pull many uh, strings and and the central bank of course, too. Of course, yeah, big finance. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, your book, it's not a, a, a intimidating book. It's a, it's a small book, and it's accessible. You wrote it for not so much for uh, scholars, but for everyone, right? It's for the average person. Average person. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's not too big, and uh, it's, it's structured in a very easy, easy way so that you uh, can flick through it in a non-sequential manner. And uh, yeah, it's it's to read. Yeah, yeah. And I I can't really actually think of another book uh, like it. Really, can you? No, that's what, that's the reason why we wrote it. I mean, we're, we're, of course, we're very indebted to uh, Professor Hopper uh, for uh, for his ideas, and we. But there's not, I think, not too much overlap between our book and that of uh, Professor Hopper. 
He touches on things like uh, the First World War, immigration, time preference, all very important, of course. Monarchy, uh, he compares the, the, the time preference in a monarchy with the time preference of politicians in a democracy, uh, favorably to the monarchy then, of course. And uh, we don't, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's when Doug French read it. He said, you know, this, is, uh, this book makes a very serious and important contribution to our thinking. Uh, that was his first comment to me when he read your book. So, oh, yeah. Please hear. Well, Frank, we are very honored uh, that that you have uh, agreed to uh, this laissez-faire edition. Uh, it will release, I think, this coming Friday, just in time for the election. So let's hope it creates an enormous controversy. And it's good that you're not living in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm surprised to hear that from you. <laughs> You're welcome to come to the Netherlands. I would love to come to the Netherlands and see you. But uh, thank you for yeah. taking the time out on this beautiful Sunday to be with us. And I look forward to talking to you again. And I look forward to the release of, of this book. And above all, congratulations for your wonderful work. Thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey. It was a pleasure.